Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. And um, in the near future, humans will fly to three different destinations in space. One will be low Earth orbit, where we fly now to the International Space Station, because we want to continue our research in microgravity. The next destinations in the 2020s will be flying to the moon, exploring it. And in the 2030s and beyond, we want to fly to Mars. Why do we, we want to explore? Well, we humans are curious. We want to know what's behind the ocean, what's below the sea. And thanks to the brave explorers, we learn so much about our own planet. We know the structure, the composition of our planet, and we know how it functions and works. So that we want to apply also to the moon. Flying to the moon will allow us to learn a lot about the solar system. And learning about the solar system will help us to understand and answer the basic questions that we have, like, is there life somewhere else? How did all this begin? And uh, how will our journey through the universe continue? So flying to the moon, we can learn about the moon, how it is built, how it is made of, but we also learn about Earth and the moon system. Because the history of Earth and moon are together for the last 4.5 billion years. So um, the Earth has changed continuously on its surface. We have the weather, we have climate, we have plate tectonics. But the Moon remained more or less constant on its surface, apart from the meteorites that impact on the surface of the Moon. But these impacts are actually interesting because we have a kind of measurement device that we can um, apply to this, counting the craters per, per area is an indicator of the age of this area. So going to the moon, taking the right samples of the area with so many impact craters and less impact craters will allow us to, give, uh, to gain a curve that gives a dependency between craters and age. And this curve we can apply throughout our inner solar system. So this curve, which is calibrated on the moon, allows us to understand the age of other planetary bodies in our system. We astronauts need to go out and find the right samples, the right stones. And if we manage to find a stone on the moon, which is 4 billion years old, the scientists will be very happy because 3.9 billion years ago, they expect that uh, the late heavy bombardment hap happened. It's when the heavy planets of our solar system changed position and a lot of objects became unstable and impacted the moon and impacted the Earth. So this affected also astrobiology. So going to the moon, collecting the right samples will give us a lot of knowledge about the solar system and thus about the question where in the universe might be a similar solar system um, similar to ours. And that could be an indicator where we should go and look for traces of life. That was one topic, studying the moon and studying the solar system. Another topic will be learning about the cosmic dawn, setting up a radio telescope on the far side of the moon, where it is shielded from the frequency, the radio noise that comes from the Earth, would allow our physicians and scientists to uh, get information, radio waves in low-frequency bands that we cannot receive on the Earth because the atmosphere shields it. And these frequencies are from the very early phase of our universe, even from a phase before the first suns were lightening up. So this will give us information concerning the question, how did all this begin? The third point that we want to investigate is technology. Because the moon, it's right there. It's three, uh, three days flight out. So we can test on the moon all the technology that we need to continue our exploration on Mars. So what kind of technology do we need? Well, first of all, we need to be able to fly out to the moon. And that is already in progress. We uh, developed the European service module together with the Orion. So I ticked this box already. The next one will be a lander. We need to get down from the orbit and land on the surface of the moon. This needs to be taken up. And the next step on the ground will be how do we achieve mobility? Because we want to explore not only one area, but many areas. So we need to 
the kind of rovers that are pressurized. So, talking about technology and uh, talking about a small station on the moon, which I envisage similar to an Arctic polar research station, which may expand in the future into a lunar village. On such a station, we can test and check important technologies, how to set up a station. Because we don't want to fly in concrete and cast or construct such a station with material brought from the Earth. No, we want to use the uh, resources that we find on site. We need to produce energy to power our station. We need to have capability to store the energy because during the lunar night we have two weeks where we have no sunlight. So how would we power our station? We need to breathe air, we need to drink water and we need to have food. So all this we could bring to the moon for a short duration mission but for an extended exploration mission or sustainable exploration and even going to Mars later on, we need these capabilities to use the resources that we find on site. Scientists are already working on that one. One method to produce oxygen, for example, is to cook it or to bake it out of the soil, out of the lunar sand. Certain sands, in this case ilmenite, is rich in oxygen. So this is a facility that is already tested uh, in Almeria in the south of Spain. It's a solar furnace, because sunlight, we have enough on the moon. Concentrating this sunlight in a furnace, in a focus, gives us temperatures up to 2,000 degrees. In this process, which is illustrated here, we only need 1,000 degrees. So heating up the, solar, uh, the, the moon sand, adding hydrogen, and heating it up to 1,000 degrees will release oxygen. Well, First, we produce water, which we can again process, and then we gain oxygen. So it's one way which actually already works in a test site. Another project that we need to follow is how to construct a lunar base. Our colleagues from DLR are working on this one, and the idea is to bring an inflatable, which weighs very little, and that inflatable could be the pressure shell for the astronauts. But the pressure shell needs to be protected, protected against the space radiation and against the micrometeoroids. So we need a kind of two to three meter thick shell around our inflatable. And this protective shell could be 3D printed using again a solar furnace, heating up the soil and sintering it together into bricks. And these bricks we could put together in a kind of Lego style and put a protective layer around it. DLI is working on that one. I believe the current TIL level is four. Another uh, problem that we need to face is dust. Five years ago, 2013, the Chinese lander on the moon, um, U-2 rover, was designed to explore the surface of the moon during several lunar days and nights. But already in the first night, it froze to death because the mechanism that um, should allow him to close the vehicle and maintain the heat inside was blocked, most probably due to dust. So dust is a challenge that we need to tackle if we want to have continuous exploration. The same experience was done or made by the Apollo astronauts. They had spacesuits and the spacesuits only after three sorties, three EVAs, three moonwalks, already had lots of dust on them, which had impacts on the joints and on the ceilings. And after three walks already, they were concerned about, is it airtight or not? In the future, when we fly to the moon, we, we want to stay there a long time. And we cannot bring a new suit every three moonwalks. So we need to find solutions how to make our technology dustproof. The next three slides are similar. They all show the same region in uh, a polar region on the moon. And uh, the first slide shows the relief. So you see the height and you see three impact craters, or actually more, but three big ones. Now focus on the three craters and you see that in this slide, the dark area indicates where or which area is constantly dark. There's never light inside these craters. So a region that is continuously, constantly dark 
also is constantly cold. The blue color here means a temperature inside these craters of around 50 Kelvin, maximum temperature. So this, for us, is an indicator that it's so cold that even water ice may be found there. And actually, scientists believe there is water ice. So the easy idea could be, uh, instead of baking out oxygen from the ground, let's just go and grab the ice. Easily said, and a compelling idea. But if you want to send astronauts down this crater, then look at the next slide. This color indicates the slope. The orange stands for a slope of 30 and more degrees. So imagine you walking down a slope of 30 degrees. It's already tricky without a spacesuit. But with a spacesuit, it's almost impossible, at least if we look at the spacesuits that we have available now. On the left, the spacesuit from the Apollo era. The astronauts needed tools to grab something on the ground because the flexibility wasn't there. The second one is the EMU suit that we use now in the International Space Station. It allows us to run EVAs in space in weightlessness, but the envelope, the working envi uh, envelope where I can actually only do my job is a box of one meter. So I can't scratch my back, I can't really bend down. This suit is absolutely not useful to work on the moon or on a planet. So NASA is working on new, better suits. Most of these suits have something in common. It's that you have internally an overpressure. I mean, on the outside, we have vacuum, so you need a kind of overpressure. Otherwise, your body would inflate and would feel unhappy. But this internal pressure, it also makes the suit stiff. And being in a stiff suit, you cannot do all the job that the geologists need to do in the field. So my hope is that the concept of the skin suit, which you see on the very far right, will come into reality. This suit actually has no or little pressure, like internally. So it's like being enclosed here in the room. And the pressure is only in the head part, where you breathe. And in order to make sure that your body doesn't expand, the textile provides stability. So coming back again to the resource of the water ice in the polar regions. For the moment being, I believe our suits, our technology doesn't allow us to go there. So the best way to find out if there's water ice is to send down a rover or a lander in this case, and ESA is working on that one. So what can we do to prepare this technology and to test all this? At EAC in Cologne, we are about to uh, construct a new facility, which we call a kind of a precursor lunar village. Um, it will be a hall where we have up to 1,000 square meters of regolith, so we can test our moonwalks. We have different lighting conditions, so we can test a low sun on the horizon and a high sun very high above us. All this changes the way we see shadows on the ground, and the shadows give us information about, is there, about the relief. And also we will have a lot of optical equipment, so we need to have this information. We also want to bring in there an offloading device. On the moon we have a gravity of 1.6 compared to Earth, so instead of 75 here, I would weigh only 12.5 kilos on the moon. This will also impact the way I drill maybe on the ground, how I take a sample, and we need to test this one. Or walking down a slope, when would I slide and fall down? On the outside of our lunar surface, we will have our small lunar base, and we test all that is needed on the inside. Apart from technology, really important is the training. The training of the explorers, because we Europeans have never been on a, another planetary surface. But also the training of the scientists that have to work with us. Because the scientists are not used to the way we do operations. So that's a focus where we work together with the science community and uh, where we have learned several lessons. And I will come back to this one later on. So ESA astronauts take part in several training units. For example, the caves training, where we go into a cave, stay there for around six days, and work in an international team. We also have geological training on the surface of Lanzarote, where we learn to read the environment, to learn 
how to interpret the geological formations, but we also go inside caves, lava caves. And we have a training together with NASA, which is called NEMO. It's an underwater training. In NEMO, we have a station that is 10 kilometers offshore of the coast of Florida. And the station is 20 meters below the water. There, in my mission, we lived for 16 days, four explorers supported or aided by two technicians. And onshore, on the land, we had our science team and the ground control team, which helped us to run the mission. Our tasks were doing jobs inside the station, and these were typically experiments that were designed for ISS operations a few months later. So we had a kind of a dry run of this experiment and checked that all the procedures were in good shape. And we did work outside of the station, a kind of a moonwalk. In our case, it was a Mars walk. And these Mars walks last for four to five hours. And I still remember it's really quick how our brain adapts. You're out there for the first walk, okay, it's a bit bizarre environment. You have this metal helmet screwed onto your shoulders. You cannot take it off. You cannot escape because if you try to go to the surface, you're fully saturated with nitrogen. So you would actually run into risk and uh, to get the, the diver disease. So you have to stay there. You have to be there until the end of the mission. And on the second spacewalk or the, sp the second uh, walk on the ground of the sea, you fully enjoy already. You see, I'm on a different planet. The color is different because at that depth, the red is already gone. And you see the nature is completely different than what you are used to. And the fishes, your new uh, colleagues are around you and they observe you. It's really interesting. So what we did there is what we will do on the moon or what we will do later on Mars, we scout. We try to find the right and the good samples for our scientists. In our case, the samples were um, corals. We were interested in supporting the scientists to better understand the, the dying of corals because of the acidity of the ocean. So we needed to find a certain type of coral, not any type of coral. And that was quite tricky. So finding the right sample is important. So we had support from our control team via video camera, but we also had a time delay, 15 minutes each way. So we needed to learn to work quite independently, <coughs> to navigate. Underwater, we don't have GPS. We will not have GPS, at least not in the beginning, on the moon or on Mars. So how do we do this? <coughs> Once we found the good samples, we had to document them, and we had to take them, meaning like drilling a, a core and just extracting it, sampling corals. And for the first time, we sampled corals and fixated them underwater. So usually the scientists take the samples, bring them up to the surface, because there was no solution how to fixate them um, underwater. But I mean, our mission lasted 16 days. The coral would have been dead by then, yeah, or deteriorated. Not every sample you need to bring back, not every sample you can bring back, because on a space mission we have limited capacity for the return of samples. So we do a lot of in situ measurements, and we bring this equipment down there and took the measurements, and then the scientists decided, okay, that's a really valuable sample, take it. And the other one, okay, it's good. Here my little helper is coming. Because now we will switch to uh, the fieldwork, geological fieldwork in Lanzarote. It's an ESA training, and we do this in Lanzarote because the surface of Lanzarote is so similar to the surface of Moon. Here on the slide, you see on the left a pyroclastic environment, which is typical for a volcanic region. On the right-hand side is my team um, learning how to read the stones, so which is a good stone and what can the stone tell us? Here we are in Lanzarote, two weeks ago. We ran this training and the interesting part is because it really looks like being on the moon. And the first mission on the moon will not be astronauts on the moon, but a rover on the moon. So in 2019, the brother 
of my friend here will be in Lanzarote, and my astronaut colleague Luca Parmitano will drive from the space station this rover, or his brother, in Lanzarote and try to pick up the good stones. Okay. Many thanks, my friend. And it's orange. <laughs> okay. So on the moon, we will be explorers. We will be working there on the surface. But we will be the hands of the uh, scientists. And different to the age of Apollo era, the scientists will be way more involved when we are on the surface. We bring new equipment there, new cameras, to allow the scientists to interact with us. And we want to get the feedback from the scientists on which samples are the good ones and which ones we can leave there. So the tools that we have on the left side, the Apollo tools, are similar to that area from a mechanical point of view. But today we bring way more electronics in the field. We have an electronic field book to better document where we took a sample, to provide the, re uh, the real context. Because the scientists today, they complain many of the Apollo samples lack the context, so it's difficult for the scientists to get all the interpretation out of the sample. So we want to do this better. We also bring a lot of cameras, and the idea or the vision is that we have such a good camera view and real-time connections to Earth, so the scientists and everyone else who is interested could wear a virtual reality goggle mask and be actually together with us on the moon, helping us to explore. On the right side bottom, you see the camera view that the scientists had this time that definitely needs to be improved and can be improved. We also have training in the cave. And I mentioned it before, the cave's training initially was designed to improve the, the, the interaction of a team that is on exploration, a team that is from different countries, different cultural backgrounds, speaks different languages. So being in an extreme environment and being always under stress, you need to work um, well together and you need to rely on your colleagues. And on the next slide, you see I'm there going down a hole of 20 meters. The colleague behind me is speaking Russian, so I need to trust him. He's my best friend in this moment. And how we work in such an intercultural team um, effectively, that's what we do in the CAVES training. But CAVES are also important for exploration. This CAVE here is a different CAVE than what we've seen before. This CAVE is a lava tube. It's in Lanzarote. And lava tubes, we know, we find also on the moon, and much, much bigger on the moon than on the Earth. On the moon, we can expect tubes with a diameter of uh, up to yeah, one kilometer, a height of 200 meters, 300 meters, because of the reduced gravity, huge cavities. Such a cavity could protect us against the space radiation. So we could set up our camp in there. So that's a cool idea that the scientists have. The only problem is how, we how do we get in there? So that we still need to develop. But such a cave is also interesting once we reach Mars. Because on the surface of Mars, the radiation will have destroyed all evidence of former life. But in a lava cave on Mars, we might have a much better chance to find traces or rests of life. And that's why we train also in our training how to take samples in lava tubes and how to make sure that this sample really contains what I collected and is not the life that is on the hand of Matthias. So that's really important. And we run here DNA um, analysis in this cave. So exploring Mars will be done on the surface and in caves. Hopefully, we will have good suits, good equipment that will allow us to do the job as efficiently as we do it right now here on Earth. And uh, the job profile of an astronaut is continuously evolving. The very first astronauts were selected because they were test pilots, they were fearless, they had quick reactions. Our generation of astronauts is the technician in the International Space Station. We do experiments 
for the scientists. We are lab technicians. In the future, astronauts need to have training how to be a geologist, how to identify a good sample. We also need to be engineers because we need to run processes how to extract resources from the ground. We need to be technicians that repair a telescope on the surface of the moon or even to install it. So our job profile is continuously expanding. But one thing will remain for sure the same. It's astronauts will always be explorers. Thank you very much.